discrimination. Which brings us to our next bit, which is our least squares regression line, which is pretty much a mathematically exact line of best fit. It's not just roughly drawing in a trend line, it's exactly figuring out what a line best represents the overall pattern of my data. And uh, the reason how it technically does that is by minimizing like the sum of like the residuals, uh, which is really interesting. But again, won't be going into that today. Uh, and it's usually in the format of y equals bx plus a, where y is our response variable, b is like the slope or the gradient, x is the explanatory variable, and a is the y-intercept. Uh, if you've ever wondered like what the y-intercept means, it's like literally referring to the y-intercept. So if we extended this trend line, the y-intercept is where this line would intercept the y-axis. And because of that, mathematically, um, whatever our y-intercept is, it's always, always, always when x equals zero. So if you ever need to find the y-intercept and you know, like, if you have values for y and x that you could use, you can just say let x equals zero and that'll tell you what your predicted y value would be for when x is zero, which would give you your y intercepts of value. So that's really important to keep in mind. Or if you know, um, it really, if you know any three of these points, you can actually mathematically figure out uh, the last, just like with any formula. So that's a quick overview of our least squares regression line. And because we have this uh, least squares regression line or this trend line, we can actually use that to make predictions by substitution. So if, for example, you know the y-intercept uh, and you know the slope and you want to know uh, what y is, for example, when x is 4, you can really just sub that straight into the equation. So let x equals 4, solve the equation and see what y would be, which would be this point about here on the line. So it would probably be something in the low 20s. That also kind of brings to an interesting distinction between interpolation and extrapolation. So have a think about if you remember the difference between those two. So interpolation is when we're making predictions within the given data set, within the range of values that we know. But extrapolation is when we're making predictions that go beyond the data that we have. And as a general rule, something really important to remember is that interpolation is always more reliable than extrapolation. Uh, because interpolation, we've got this data, we've calculated this trend line based off this data, but the danger is with extrapolation is we actually have we actually have like no way to know whether this pattern like continues on beyond other, like the research that we've done because most patterns, most linear patterns don't go on for forever. For example, with my car example from earlier, if that linear line pattern kept going, eventually a car that had driven a certain amount of kilometers would be free or even like negative dollars, which just doesn't make sense. So that's the danger of extrapolation. It can kind of like give us values that just aren't reasonable or possibly aren't even possible. So that's the danger with extrapolation. And also have a go at see if you can identify where the residuals are on this graph. Uh, our residuals are these distances here. So the residual is the vertical distance between the actual data point and its predicted value from the line of best fit. So this would be our residual value here for this point here. So linking it back in again to what we were saying earlier about our R value, um, uh, with our R value, we were saying that it's only appropriate to use a Pearson's correlation coefficient if it's linear, but it's also only appropriate to use a linear trend line if it's got a linear relationship present. So how do we know if a linear relationship is present? And like I um, alluded to earlier, it is with residual plots. So that's how we determine uh, whether a linear relationship is present or not. So a residual plot might look something like one of these. So how do we actually interpret uh, a residual plot? And again, they exist to test the assumption of linearity. So if we're constructing a residual plot, our goal is to figure out if a linear relationship is present. The most important thing to remember, or like the handiest way that I, it kind of sticks in my brain how I remember it, is if it's non-random, then it's non-linear. But if it's linear, the points will be randomly scattered above and below the line. So I'll show you what I mean here. So here, 
our data points are not random. There's actually like a pattern going on there. And that's kind of like the goal of a residual plot. It kind of zooms in to see if there's any underlying trends or patterns that we kind of couldn't see in the original scatter plot. And that's what's happened here. We've plotted all our values on the residual plot, and I won't go into now how to calculate the residuals and all of that. That's something I could do some practice questions on a little bit later if you'd like to rehearse that knowledge. Um, but because we can see here, our points aren't randomly scattered. There's actually a really clear pattern going on here. That's what I meant earlier about how non-random means non-linear. So if I come back to our next slide again, this is non-random. Therefore, from this residual plot, I would conclude that this relationship is non-linear. Whereas this one, we can see that our residual points are randomly scattered above and below the line. So it's super random. So this tells me that there is a linear relationship present. So when interpreting residual plots, non-random means non-linear and randomly scattered around, yes, it is linear. So that's just a little clarification on residual plots. And again, least squares regression lines, you can also calculate the A and B values using your calculator. It's almost the exact same process as doing it with your R value. I've got the steps up on the screen here. It's mode two, two, enter your values, press on, shift one, five, then you press one, which will correspond to A, if you're wanting to find out the A value, uh, which is the Y intercept, or you press two, if you're wanting to find out B. Uh, which is your gradient or your slope. And another word of caution here is it's important to make sure uh, that you've got your X, what you've classed as your, uh, your X values consistent and your Y values consistent. Because if you flipped your X and your Y values, you would get different variables. So that's why it's important to identify what's your explanatory variable and what's your response variable right at the start. And like I touched on earlier, association does not mean causation. When we're talking about scatter plots, we're talking about correlations, we're talking about associations, but we cannot uh, discern causation from that. There's lots of different things it could be. It could be the common response, confounding variables, or sometimes a coincidence. So that's just another word of caution there. Whenever we're talking about all of this, uh, we're talking about association and correlation, not causation, because there could always be kind of underlying factors or other variables that are kind of influencing our data that might not be obvious at first. So a quick overview to sum up what we just talked about with um, our scatter plots and everything, which is actually called like a regression analysis. You can kind of see like the awesome kind of like overarching pattern uh, of like why we kind of do each step. So we start out with like we construct the scatter plot to see if like visually like can we actually identify is there an association or a pattern present and then we can calculate an R value to kind of get that precise strength of the relationship and that also tells us about the direction and then from there we can like calculate a least squares regression line we can plot that on our scatter plot we can interpret the, the y intercept and the slope to see like what actually is going on here uh, we can learn more by calculating a coefficient of determination, which we talk about that in terms of like the predictive power. Um, we can use our line to, we can use our least squares regression line to make pre uh, predictions. Sorry, not using the residual line, using the least squares regression line, we can make predictions. Uh, we can also do a residual plot to test the assumption of linearity. Uh, we can write a report to communicate our findings. We can answer questions about it. Um, and then this would be a little bit different for categorical data. Have a think about uh, our pro how our process differed for when we were interpreting categorical data. So that's kind of the thousand foot overview of what we just went over, bringing it all together. I hope this is helpful, kind of gives you like a bit of an idea in your mind of, uh, yeah, all the, like the different little things that we've just gone over that kind of puts.